Okay, take your Bibles this morning, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. We've been doing a, a virtual tour through the Holy Land and looking at different places and uh, having a message from what occurred at that particular biblical site. And so today we're talking about a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. And it's kind of a funny name. Uh, it's an area that's north of the Sea of Galilee. I know you're very familiar with the Sea of Galilee on the map. And so Jesus did a lot of things in, in the Sea of Galilee area. And about 25 miles north of there, not too far away, is this place called Caesarea Philippi. It's named after two individuals, two men. One of them, of course, was uh, Tiberius Caesar, the Caesar at that time. And the other one's name was Philip. Philip was one of the sons of Herod the Great. And when Herod the Great died, they divided up the kingdom into four parts, and he got one of them. And so he was in charge of overseeing the area of north of uh, Galilee during the time of Christ. And so he named it after the Caesar, and he named it after himself, Caesarea Philippi. So that's how it got its name. Uh, before Christ, it was an area known as Paneas, P-A-N-E-A-S, Paneas which is a strange name, and, and that's a, a name that was uh, used to commemorate the Greek god Pan out of Greek mythology. And so if you look up the, the Greek god Pan, uh, if you Google it or look it up in an encyclopedia or something, uh, you'll see that uh, Pan was considered to be the god of nature, the god of shepherds and wildlife and all of that. He was supposed to have the head of a goat and the legs of a goat and the torso of a man. So he's really ugly, uh, these uh, statues that they have of him. Anyway, uh, the Greeks believe that Pan, being the god of nature, was always running around out in the wildlife and all of that, you know, and stirring up trouble and those kinds of things. And um, that's where the name Panic comes from. If you're out by yourself somewhere, or it's dark, and you get scared, and all of a sudden you're filled with anxiety, you know, and you have that adrenaline rush and everything, well, we say we panic. Well, that's where the word comes from, panic. They felt like he was out there running around you and making you nervous. So that's interesting. Uh, the Aramaic word is, is uh, banyas. They changed the P to a B, and so it's called banyas uh, today. But um, anyway, the pagans believed that uh, a large cave that was in that area was the gateway to Hades. That's very significant to today's message. And so this is a very beautiful area. It's very lush and you know, green and all that. And spring water was at one time during the time of Christ coming out of this big cave. And the Greeks and the Romans believed that that was the entrance to Hades. And so they built a building there, a shrine. And they put up idols and that kind of stuff of Pan and other gods, false gods, of course, in that area. And that's where they worship. This pagan worship was taking place. But they believe that cave was the gateway to Hades. I've got a few pictures I was going to show you of the area. The first one uh, shows the cave from a distance as you're walking up to the site. You can see the cave back there in the, in the background and some people standing in front of it. So at one time there was a, like a gable, I think it's a gable type building that was built in front of that cave, a shrine, uh, commemorating the entranceway to Hades. And off to the right of the cave there, you can see uh, an opening. There's someone standing in front of that. That's a niche. There are other niches around that. And that's where they would place these little idols, these little stone idols of their gods. And so uh, this is the most distinctive uh, area uh, dealing with Caesarea Philippi because of the cave. You can see the spring water that's kind of coming from the base of the area. Uh, this is kind of near the base of Mount Hermon. And so there's lots of spring water in this area. At one time, spring water flowed from the cave itself, but an earthquake shifted the, the ground and everything, and water is no longer in the cave. But uh, this is the, called the entrance to Hades, the cave uh, entrance to Hades at Caesarea Philippi. Okay, the next picture shows some of those niches where the idols would be placed. You can see the big one there and then the smaller ones around it. So these date back to the time of Christ, and they place these little stone figurines or idols uh, up in the wall there. And I'm sure there were other things around there as well, but that was uh, a part of their idol worship that took place among the Greeks and the Romans during the time of Christ. Okay, the next picture uh, shows some more water. This is down to the left of the cave area, some more of the spring water that's flowing from that area. 
And so there's a lot of spring water in the area, and uh, it's very clear, it's really beautiful. Uh, this is really an amazing place um, because it's so different than the rest of the country. You know, I've mentioned down south, it's real barren. You'll see pictures later of this desert looking area and there's no vegetation or anything, just rolling hills and barren, uh, dry hills like a desert. And it's so different up north in the Galilee area, and this is about 20, 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Lots of spring water, lots of trees, mountainous type area and everything. And of course, Mount Hermon is the, the tallest mountain in Israel, and it's very, very close to this, just north of this site. And right after Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, immediately after that, the Bible tells us that the transfiguration took place. So I'm convinced that it was on Mount Hermon. That's not the traditional site, but I think that's where it happened. And so just probably 10 miles or so from here, north of here is where Mount Hermon is at. Now, the tallest mountain in Israel, it's 9,000 feet above sea level. It's got snow on it year-round, and so the snow melts. And there's spring water from other sources as well in this area that feed into the Jordan River and go down to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, the next picture shows a, a waterfall. It's really close to this area, uh, some of the spring water. And actually, this very picture was on the cover of a, uh, a Sunday School Quarterly not long ago. So it's really a beautiful area. You go down these steps down to this uh, you know, viewing area platform and you can see the beautiful waterfalls uh, down in the, among the, the vegetation and everything. And then the water flows on down from there. The next picture shows the water flowing from there. So doesn't that look like you're up in the mountains or something? You could almost picture somebody trout fishing right there, couldn't you? And so a lot of folks don't realize that there are sites and places like this in Israel today. Uh, next picture also shows some water. This is at Dan, which is just a few miles from this area, but it's a similar type uh, geography and everything. And you can walk through this. We always hike through this area up to the ancient site of Dan. The tribe of Dan relocated from the Philistine area when they were having trouble with the Philistines all the way up to the north and took over that area. And so there's an ancient uh, altar site that was built there where they started worshiping Baal. And so that site is still there, but also the ancient city of Dan is in this area. And then you've got the water, the spring water that is flowing through this area from the Mount Hermon area and eventually into the, the Jordan River. Got another couple of pictures, I think, of the water. And so it's just really a, an amazing, beautiful place to visit. And you can kind of understand why Jesus would go to places like this. You know, it was so uh, isolated. It was so uh, serene. And oftentimes we know he would go off and be by himself to pray, but he would also take his disciples places where they could rest and where they could uh, have instruction from him and everything, kind of get away from the crowds. And so I think that's probably why Jesus took his disciples up to this area. And so something very significant took place while they were there. And of course, right after that, the, uh, the transfiguration. And so this morning, I want us to talk about what happened at Caesarea Philippi. In Matthew chapter 16, and verses 13 through 15, the Bible says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, Jesus has already sent out the twelve, and they've gone around to villages, and they've been empowered to cast out demons, and to teach, and to tell people about Jesus. Jesus has already fed the 5,000 and the 4,000 prior to this. So a lot of things have happened. And so now they've gone up to this area to kind of be alone, and Jesus asks them this, this question, who are, who are people saying I am? What's the talk about me in the villages? And they replied, some say that you're Elijah, some say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And, um, and he said, well, what about you? What do you say? Who do you think I am? And so I can imagine when Jesus asked this question that there was this moment of silence they know Jesus is certainly sent from God. They know he's working miracles. I think they have a sense of who he is, but I guess no one has just come out and said it yet. And so they come to this point where Jesus asks this pointed question. You know, everybody's talking about me as one of the prophets. Some have even said he was John the Baptist. John the Baptist had already been, headed, been beheaded by this time. And so they thought that he is someone who had come back from the dead and was working miracles. But he says, who do you guys think I am? Who do you say I am? Now that one question is a question that every single person on this planet is going to have to answer someday. Every person must answer that question about Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? 
You know, even the Muslims believe that Jesus was a great prophet. Uh, it's, in, uh, it's in their writings. They believe he's a great prophet. They just don't believe in him as the Son of God. They certainly don't believe in him as the Savior of the world. But there are a lot of people who have great respect for Jesus. They don't question the historicity of Jesus. They know he existed. But they just see him as a good man, a good Jewish teacher, a rabbi. Others would say, well, he was a great prophet who did amazing things, apparently worked some miracles and things like that. But a lot of people do not recognize Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And so you've got to answer that question for yourself. Who do you think and who do you say Jesus Christ is? And that's what I want us to look at this morning because in the remainder of these verses here, we really have for us what it means to be a follower of Jesus or to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word disciple simply means to follow someone, to follow Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. And so what does it mean to become a, a disciple or a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so let's look here at Matthew 16, and let's read verses 16 through 19. Now, Simon Peter is always the one who was so impetuous and who would just blurt things out, you know. He's the one that got out of the boat and, and walked on the water. We saw that last week. He's the one that took out a sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest when they came to arrest Jesus. So he's always the one that's just kind of, you know, barreling into the room and just blurting things out and all that. So they're all standing there, and I can just kind of see in my mind's eye, you know, Peter just, just blurting all this out, you know, when Jesus asked this question, who do you guys say I am? And so in, in verse 16, it says that he, he answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay? So we have this uh, very dramatic event taking place where Jesus says, well, who do people say I am? And then he says, well, who do you guys say I am? And then Peter blurts this out and gives this great proclamation about the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to me, as we go through this, it really shows us how, how we can become a disciple or a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is involved in this? What takes place in becoming a disciple of Jesus? Are you a faithful follower of Christ? You wouldn't be here this morning if you weren't at least interested in Jesus. But do you know him as your personal Savior? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Is he the most important person in your life? Do you worship him? Do you, do you honor him? Do you try to live your life according to his will? That's the big question. Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, several things are involved in being a disciple. First of all, the Lord has to invite you to be saved. The Lord invites us to be saved. Verse 16 again, Peter blurts this out, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, You're blessed, Simon. He said, For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And so in other words, Jesus said, Well, Simon, this is not something you came up with on your own. This is something that has been revealed to you by the work of my Father. The Holy Spirit of God had revealed to him, of course, who Jesus was, his identity. And so it kind of really shows us how, how salvation begins. You have to you enter into this relationship with Jesus by being drawn into that relationship by the Holy Spirit of God. Several things I want to mention about how salvation occurs. First of all, you have that conviction. You're convicted by the Holy Spirit that you're a sinner, that you need to have your sins forgiven. You have this understanding in your mind and in your heart that you can't go to heaven unless your sins are forgiven. And so you come to understand that you're a sinner and you need to do something about that sin. That sin needs to be forgiven so that you can inherit eternal life, so you can go to heaven someday. And so we have this conviction of the Holy Spirit. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so we have that experience when we come to know Christ of him drawing us into this relationship that conviction of the Holy Spirit, where we have remorse for our sin, we feel guilty because of our sin, but also we have this understanding that you can't go to heaven unless you have this personal relationship with Jesus. He's the only way you can go to heaven. 
The Bible says there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. And so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so a lot of folks today think you get to heaven by being a good person, by going to church, by giving money to the church, by just being an honest person. But that's not it, is it? The only way you can go to heaven, the only way you can have eternal life is to have this personal relationship with Jesus. You have to enter into that relationship. And that begins with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You remember when you were first convicted about your sin? You remember when you were first convicted to make a decision about Christ, if you know him as your Savior? I remember those days. I remember as a, as a boy, you know, feeling that conviction of God's Holy Spirit. I remember coming to church. My mom took me to church, you know, and I remember sitting out there in my place, and I remember the preacher preaching, and I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart and telling me that's what you need to do. You need to know Christ as your Savior. You need to have your sins forgiven. Now, I didn't immediately become a Christian when I first had that experience. Most people don't. But I, I thank the Lord that He continued to convict me about that and to trouble me about that until I made a decision. I remember watching other people come forward during the invitation time of the church, and sometimes they'd be crying, you know, and I was wondering about that. What's that all about? And I remember very distinctly uh, when I was a young boy, uh, a young lady was playing the piano in the church. And uh, she played every Sunday. She was probably just a teenager, if I remember right, just a very young, young lady. And, and one time during the invitation of the church, she, just, she was playing the piano, and she just stopped and just ran over to the preacher at the, at the front of the church because she was so convicted about something. And so she had to do something about that. That conviction was, was gnawing at her and troubling her so much, she had to do something about it. She wasn't going to have peace until she got right with the Lord. Now, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit, right? And the Lord does that not just to make us feel uncomfortable. He does that because He loves us, and He desperately wants to have a relationship with us. And so He invites us to enter into that relationship with Him. That's what the conviction is all about. It's not about making you just feel bad. It's about drawing you into this relationship with Him. He wants you to be one of His children. God loves you too much to just let you keep on going the way you're going. He wants you to come into that relationship with Him. Many of you have made that, that decision, and you know what that's all about. And then there's conviction after you're saved, of course, to, to be faithful to the Lord, to, to honor Him, to, to read His Word, to attend church, to be involved in church. All those kinds of things uh, cause us to have conviction. Many times people describe it as when they, when they give in to the Lord's will as having a burden kind of lifted off of them. Does that sound right to you? Uh, you just have this burden, you have this conviction, you have this guilty feeling, your conscience is bothering you. And then when you make that decision to get right with the Lord, all of a sudden that, that relief comes, that flood of relief where that burden is just taken off of you because now you have been faithful to do what the Lord has instructed you to do. And so that's how it begins. It begins with the, the conviction of God's Holy Spirit. And then there's the confession confessing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, there's not a magic formula or anything like that. Salvation is all about believing in your heart, having faith in Jesus. But it's also about acting upon that by doing something. And, of course, most, for most of us, that would be speaking or praying, right? Asking Jesus to save you. Now, if you remember the thief on the cross when he got saved right before he died, all he said was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so he expressed his faith in Jesus by what he said. The Bible says, out of your heart, you speak from your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so whatever's in your heart, however you feel with inside you, is generally going to come out of your mouth, right? Sooner or later. And so that's what this verse means, that we confess with our mouths, we simply say that we believe in Jesus, we trust in Him, we ask Him to be our Lord and Savior, we make a confession, and behind that confession, of course, is our faith. We really do believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as our personal Savior. We recognize that He came and died for me and you that we could go to heaven. And so we make that decision. We make that confession of faith in the Lord. And so... That's what Peter did, right? I mean, he just blurted it out. You, know, you are the Son of God. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Anointed One. You're the Son of God. 
and he recognized who Jesus was, and he proclaimed it. He confessed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the second step, really, in salvation. There's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's your confession. You, you can do that by speaking. You can do that by praying silently. You can do that by coming forward during a worship service and saying, I want to trust in Christ as my Savior. You're, you're confessing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then comes the, the conversion, a word that we use that talks about becoming a brand new person through your faith in Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. You become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. What that means is that when you believe in Jesus and you trust in Him and you, you express your faith in Him in some way, the Holy Spirit of God actually comes and takes up residence within your soul. That's a miracle, isn't it? You're born again, you're saved, and the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart and soul, and you become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. You're never going to be the same again. You're not the same person anymore. You may not feel a whole lot different. You're certainly not going to look a whole lot different. But now you have God's Holy Spirit within your soul because of your expression of faith. You've trusted in Him as your personal Savior. That's very, very important. That's the most important decision a person can ever make to trust in Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. There's nothing more important than that, to know that you've been saved, that you're going to heaven someday, and that no one or no thing can ever take that away from you. And so that's the most important decision a person can ever make. Now notice this verse at the bottom of your outline, Matthew 22 and verse 14. Jesus spoke these words. He said, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are called, or many are invited, but few are chosen. What's that mean? This one verse right here, to me, absolutely refutes Calvinism. You know, there's this big movement in Calvinism today, you know. I, I'm, I'm not a Calvinist at all. Calvinists teach, Presbyterians teach, that, uh, that faith is a gift of God. That God gives you that gift of faith, and He gives it to some and withholds it from others. And uh, that He just chooses certain people to be saved and certain people not to be saved and there's no conditions whatsoever. Well, I don't agree with that. I think that faith is a condition. And I think that faith is something that you decide for yourself. You have that free will choice to believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And to me, this verse is one of those verses that clearly teaches that. I've never had a Calvinist explain this to me. Jesus said, many are invited, but few are chosen. Now let me ask you a question. Why would Jesus invite anybody to be saved if they couldn't be saved. Why would he do that? Certainly not everybody's going to be saved, right? Jesus said many who are invited are not saved. Well, why would he invite you to be saved if it was impossible for you to be saved? If he wasn't going to give you the gift of faith? If he was going to give it to some and withhold it from others? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Why would the Lord do that? That simply makes no sense at all. Jesus said that uh, there's going to be more people really going to hell than they are going to heaven when it's all said and done. He said, broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to uh, destruction, and many enter in through that gate. And he said, narrow is the gate and narrow and straight is the way that leads to eternal life. And he said, only a few find it. And so he's saying that there's be a majority of people someday that we're going to end up in Hades compared to those, of course, that end up in heaven because of their faith in Christ. But the Lord invites people to come to faith in Him and believe in Him, but not everybody chooses to do that. It's called free will. Some people decide not to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, right? You have that choice. This is throughout the Scriptures, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember when Adam and Eve were created and then uh, the, the uh, tree of the, of the knowledge and good and evil was placed there and the Lord said, you can eat from any tree you want except this one tree? They had to make a choice, make a decision as to whether they would eat from that tree or not. They had free will, right? They got to choose for themselves. And so Jesus said, many are invited, but few are chosen. You're chosen because of your faith in Jesus. The reason it's worded this way in other passages in Scripture is because it speaks to the sovereignty of God. You can't do anything to save yourself. Faith is a free will choice, but your salvation is all about what Jesus did for you on the cross, right? It's not about what you did. It's not about you earning it or anything like that. You can't do that. But you make a decision, you make a choice to believe in Jesus based on your own free will. 
And I like to say that God is sovereign. God chooses to let me choose. He chooses to do that. He chooses to let you choose. Make a decision as to whether or not you'll believe in Jesus or not. Another verse that, that really speaks to this is 2 Peter 3, 9, where the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. Well, then why do some perish? If God doesn't want anybody to perish, God is sovereign. Why is it that many people, most people do perish? It's because they choose not to believe in Jesus, right? So the point is you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Do you believe in Him or do you not believe in Him? Have you confessed Him as your personal Savior? Or have you not done that? You know, the, the greatest testimony and confession of faith in Christ is baptism. Did you know that? Baptism doesn't save you at all, but it's a beautiful picture of a person experiencing death, burial, and resurrection. The death of that old person and being made a brand new person in Christ Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit and being born again. It's also a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so that's the greatest, really greatest testimony and confession of faith and profession of faith that anybody can make is when you're baptized. And so that's why we baptize. The Lord instructed us to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's a profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. Many, many churches, including ours, we have an invitation time at the close of the service, and we invite people to, to make a decision. And we say, well, somebody walked the aisle today. Somebody comes down the aisle and talks to the preacher at the front of the church and makes some kind of a decision, either a decision of salvation, a decision to join the church, or maybe a decision to, to do something else, pray about something, whatever. But we call it walking the aisle, and many times they stand before the church and say, I have accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'd like to come and be baptized and join this church. We call that a profession of faith, right? Nothing wrong with that at all. That's perfectly fine. But your profession of faith, your primary profession of faith, is your baptism. That's how you declare it. And so it's a beautiful thing. I've said this many times when we have a baptism. Almost always, almost always, I'll have somebody come back to the welcome room at the end of the service and ask me about that. You know, I, need, I need to talk to you about that. You know, and what was that all about? And when that happened, I just felt like the Lord was speaking to my heart and and could you talk to me about that? I think maybe I need to make a decision. I've had that happen so many times. It's no mystery to me as to why the Lord instructed us to baptize people. Because that's your profession of faith. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to baptize some folks in the Jordan River in, in Israel. That's always an exciting thing. And so you get out there and they've got this place uh, set up. It's in the area near where Jesus was baptized. It's really a moving emotional experience. And, and you baptize folks. Uh, and it may have even been Heather. I remember I baptized Heather in the, in the Jordan River, but on one occasion, we were with another group, and wouldn't you know it, the group we were with were a bunch of Presbyterians. And so there we are, a few of us Baptists, and we joined up with these Presbyterians, and we're visiting Israel, and here I am out there baptizing a few folks. I think maybe it was Heather. And uh, after I did that, a, a gentleman who was among the Presbyterian group came up to me, and he just had tears in his eyes. And he'd never seen that before. See, they, they sprinkle babies. And so he didn't understand what that was all about. He said, he said that, that's amazing. He said, I, I've not seen anything like that before. He said, that just really, really touched my heart to see that. You know, it's, it's clear to me the Holy Spirit convicts people when they see something like that, when they see someone expressing their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That's why it's so important that uh, a Christian is baptized. Because it's a profession of your faith in Christ. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. In other words, if you're really saved, y'all be excited about it. Y'all be proud that you know Christ is your Savior. When we have the privilege of baptizing someone in our church, everybody claps, right? Some might think, well, that's just not very reverent. Well, it's not really a time to be super reverent, right? It's a time to celebrate, to be excited. Because someone has just professed their faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And so salvation, discipleship, being a follower of Jesus begins with that conviction. The Holy Spirit's knocking on your door. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. And he said, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. You've got to open the door and let him come in, right? 
You've got to make that decision based on your own free will. And so the Lord invites us to be saved. And then secondly, the Lord is the one who builds his church. It's the Lord who builds the church, not us. Look at verse 18. Jesus told Peter, he said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, will not prevail against it. Now there's kind of a play on words here. Most likely at this time Jesus was speaking Aramaic, that was the common language. And so you've got to play on words between Peter and the word rock. And when we have the Greek here, the Holy Spirit inspired this in the Greek language, there's a very precise difference between the name Peter and the word rock. And this is very significant, it's very important. In Greek, the word Peter is petros, it means a little rock, a little small stone, like a pebble. And so that's what that word means. You know, Peter was referred to as, as Simon. He was, his name was Simon. But Jesus said, I'm going to call you Peter because of this declaration, this confession that you just made. I'm going to call you a little rock. And then there's this play on words, and he says, I will build my church on this rock. On this rock, I will build my church. The next word there for rock is Petra, which means a big rock, a huge boulder. So you see the significance? You see the difference? Jesus tells his disciple, Peter, you're a little rock, and upon this big rock, this big boulder, I'm going to build my church. So what's he talking about? He's talking about Peter's faith. He's saying, Peter, you're like a, a small rock in a huge boulder, a small part of that that's been chipped off from a big, big boulder. And he said, upon this faith, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Every single one of us who knows Christ as Savior, all of us are a part of the church, right? The Lord has added us to the church because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And so you're, like, you're a part of that rock, right? And of course, the Bible tells us the rock is the Lord himself. But we're a part of the church because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Lord told Peter. You're Peter, you're a small rock, and on this boulder I'm going to build my church. And then he says, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades. Now remember where they're at. They're at Caesarea Philippi. They're out there close to that big cave. And all these guys are thinking, well, that's over there. The Greeks think that's the gateway to Hades. And Jesus said, the gates of Hades will not prevail against my church. You see why he said what he said in the place he said it? It's, it's teaching them based on their surroundings, something that is very, very important that he wanted them to know. He said, I'm going to build my church. And he said, the gates of Hades will not stop us. They will not prevail against what we're trying to do. Now, what does that mean? Well, the gates of Hades refers to Satan's evil plans, his plotting and his planning to stop people from being saved, to hinder the cause of Christ. Back in those days, all the villages, most of them, had a wall built around them. Usually the, the village was up on a hill. Jesus said, a, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Remember that? And they built this wall around the city for defensive purposes, and they all obviously had a big gate. And if any enemy came about or anything, they would just have everybody come into the city, and they would be inside the walls, and they would close these big old gates so that the enemy couldn't come in. And the city gates of any city was kind of like town hall. That's where all the leading elders of the church would go and discuss things. That's where the men would hang out and all of that and talk about the problems of the, the village and the city and all of that. Remember in Proverbs 31, the, Proverbs about the, the proverb about the virtuous woman? The Bible says that her husband is known at the city gates. He's well known. He's a person of importance. And so this is like city hall. This is where all the leading Individuals and leaders in the village would gather and discuss things and make plans and all of that. And so that's what this means. Jesus said the gates of Hades, the plotting of Satan and all his leaders and minions and all of his demons and all of that, they can do all the plotting and planning they want to. They're not going to prevent the church from being built. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to add to my church. I'm going to invite people to believe in me and come to faith in me and confess me as their personal Lord and Savior and become a part of the church. Remember when you got saved? If you know Christ as your Savior this morning, you remember when that happened? 
you know, sometimes we can't remember the exact day. I don't remember the day of the week, you know, when that happened. I remember praying with a preacher at my home. He came by my, my home and prayed with me in my living room because I had talked to my mom about this. I've had that conviction. He came by, and I remember sitting with him on the couch in the living room over on Apache Street, southeast Amarillo, and we, we talked, and he prayed with me, and I remember praying and asking Jesus Christ to come into my heart. And then that next Sunday, I went forward, made a profession of faith, you know, before the church, and that Sunday night, I was baptized. And that really was my profession of faith, right? And so, remember when that happened for you? If you know Christ, do you remember when you made that decision, when you trusted in Him and you believed in Him? When you did that, you did it because of that conviction of your sin. You confessed Him as your Savior. You trusted Him by faith. And that's when the Lord added you to the church. The Bible says the Lord adds to the church. The book of Acts, He added to the church daily those who are being saved. And so it's the Lord who builds the church. It's the Lord who adds to His church by inviting you to become a part of His family. And then He gives you that opportunity to make that decision and to trust in Him. And really, that's what Jesus did for, for Peter and the other guys. He said, who do people say I am, and who do you say I am? Do you really believe in me? Do you know who I am? Do you trust in me? And so you have to make that decision. And so the true church, of course, is built by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of churches today. I saw one on television the other day, a huge, huge mega church in a stadium, and just had thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this church, you know, and I thought, wow. That's incredible. You know, look at all these people that are going to that church and everything. That's, that's really a neat thing. And, and yet I've watched this on television several times, and very seldom do I ever hear anything about the gospel or about being a sinner or about being convicted of your sins. You hardly ever hear that. And so not every church, and I'm not naming names, but not every church, of course, has been built by the Lord himself, right? Some churches are built by men. And unless they're preaching the truth, unless they're preaching the gospel, unless they're preaching the Word of God, then it's not a church that's been built by God, right? It's built by men. And so we have to make sure we understand that the true church is built by the Lord Himself. He adds to the church those who believe in Him and trust in Him. Well, after you experience that conviction, as most of you have, and you make that decision to confess Christ as your Savior, and he adds you to the church. That's what we call a conversion experience that takes place. Then the Lord expects us to share that good news with other people. He expects you to tell people about your salvation decision. Now that's very important, isn't it? Jesus had already sent the 12 disciples out to the other villages and everything. And says, go and work miracles and raise, raise the dead, cast out demons, do all kinds of miracles and, and miraculous things and teach them about me and tell them the kingdom of God is at hand and all of that. And so these people went out and did that. And they were sharing the good news of salvation with everyone who would listen, everyone who was interested. Matthew 16, verse 9, Jesus, again talking to Peter here, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so Jesus here is speaking to Peter, but he's actually addressing all of the disciples at the same time, because he said pretty much the same thing in Matthew 18 to all of his disciples, not just to Peter. Now, these verses are where the Catholics come up with the idea of Peter being the first pope, you know, the vicar of Christ. Vicar means on behalf of someone else. A vicarious offering is to offer yourself on behalf of others. And so Peter is known by the Catholics as the vicar of Christ, or the first pope, uh, you know, or intercessory between him and us. And of course, that's not taught in the scripture. You don't need anybody between you and the Lord because you, you can go straight to the throne of grace yourself, right? and believe in Him without a priest doing that for you. Jesus Christ is our high priest, the Bible says, and so you don't need an earthly priest for that, uh, that opportunity to come to Christ. And so Jesus here is talking really to all of His disciples, and He says, I'm going to give you guys the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You got the key. Now what's a key all about? Somebody hands you a key, what does that, what does that mean? Does that make you feel kind of good when somebody gives you a key? It's a sign of authority, right? What if you go out in the driveway and somebody gives you the key to a brand new car? Get real excited about that, right? 
or you get your new home and, and somebody hands you that key, that key to your home. And so it's, it's a kind of a sign of authority, right? You're authorized to open that door and to go in somewhere, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. He says, I'm giving you guys the authority to go out there and to tell people about me, to share the gospel message so that that door can be opened so that people can be saved. And he says, whatever you bind here on earth is going to be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose here on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Well, the word bind really means to forbid something, to prevent something from happening. And so if you, if you don't tell anybody about Jesus, if you don't encourage people to come to faith in Christ, then they might not have that opportunity to be saved, right? And so the Lord would have us to invite people to come to faith in Christ. He wants us to go out and talk to people about our faith. Now the word loose on earth means to permit something. If you lose something, you permit it to happen, right? And so the Lord is telling us here that, you know, a person can only be saved by faith in Christ. And, of course, the Lord understands that and, and uh, is aware of that, of course, in heaven. But he said, it's really, it's up to you guys to go out there and to share the good news of salvation with everybody who will listen and give them an opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. That's what I want you to do. And so we tell these jokes about going to to heaven and standing at the pearly gates and St. Peter is there, of course. You know, that's where this comes from, but all of us have that important commission, don't we? In fact, every Christian holds the keys of heaven. Every single Christian holds the keys of heaven. You've been authorized as an ambassador of Christ to go out and tell people about Jesus, to invite them to come to faith in Him and believe in Him. I asked you a moment ago, if you know Christ as your Savior, do you remember when that happened? And was somebody involved in telling you about Jesus? Do you have a mom or a dad or a Sunday school teacher? Or did you go to church and you heard a sermon? Was it a Sunday school class and you listened to the teacher or something? Or did you just open your Bible and read it for yourself and, and fall under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and recognize that you needed to be saved? Certainly it can happen that way. But most of the time, somebody tells us about Jesus, right? Right? Do you remember who first told you about Christ? Do you remember who introduced you to Jesus Christ and shared the good news of salvation with you? You know, my mom did that for me and told me about the Lord. She brought me to Sunday school, and I listened to the Sunday school teachers reinforce that message on a regular basis every Sunday when I would come to Sunday school. I'd sit out there in the sanctuary and listen to the preacher preaching the gospel, and again and again and again I heard the gospel message of how I could become a believer in Jesus Christ. And then came the moment of decision when I decided to trust in Jesus as my personal Savior. Does that sound familiar to you? It should, because for most of you, the same thing happened to you, right? Somebody cared enough about you to tell you about Jesus. And so we need to be praying for people to be saved. And we need to be serious about sharing our faith with everybody we can. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are your kids saved? Is your daughter saved? Is your son saved? Are your mom and dad, are they saved? What about your other family members? Are they all saved? Do they all believe in Jesus? Of course, not everybody's going to believe. Have you reached out to them? Have you shared with them? Have you encouraged them to come to faith in Christ? What about your grandchildren? Are your grandchildren saved? We need to pray. Pray that people will come to know Christ as Savior. Right now, we can't make them do that. We can't we can't force them to do that. They have to make a decision, right? But we need to do everything we can to reach out to them, to share, to encourage, and to invite people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said we try to persuade men. We try to persuade people to believe. Now the Holy Spirit does the convicting. We can't do that. We just do the sharing, right? We do the encouraging. But it's the Holy Spirit of God that convicts people to become a believer and it's the Holy Spirit of God that, that saves them. God saves them when they come to faith in Christ, right? Our part is to tell what we know about our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we need to do that. All around us are people who are lost, who do not know Christ, who need to be saved. And we need to encourage them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. It could be that you've come this morning and God brought you here for the very purpose of becoming a believer today. 
And maybe you knew in your mind what it was all about. You knew something about Jesus. You understand something about the Bible. But maybe you have never truly trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Let me ask you a question this morning. If that's true of you, do you, do you feel any conviction right now? Do you feel like the Lord is speaking to your heart? Then this is what you need to do. You need to make this decision. You say, well, what are you going to do to me? You going to make me come down there and give a speech or something? No. You don't have to do anything like that. All you got to do is just come let me know. Just let me know. And I'll pray with you. I can lead you in a very simple prayer where you can invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart. It's funny how we get all tied in knots and worried and scared about making a public profession of faith sometimes. You know why that is? Because the devil doesn't want you to do it. He's saying those people are going to look at you and wonder about you and you're going to be embarrassed. Listen, most of the people here this morning have already been saved. Why would they be embarrassed about you doing something they've already done, right? People rejoice in a decision like that. It's the greatest decision you can ever make. The Bible says when one soul repents, when one person comes to faith in Christ, the angels in heaven rejoice. They're watching right now. It's almost like they're holding their breath, wondering, is he going to be saved? Is she going to be saved today? And so if you need to be saved, you come and get saved, all right? Don't put it off. Well, we'll think about it a while. You, you've thought about it enough. If you're convicted, he wants you to come right now, all right? Today is the day of salvation. This is the moment of decision. And so you need to make that decision right now. It's the most important decision you can ever make, and you don't want to put that off. You don't want to take that chance. Make sure you're saved. And if you are saved, and you know you're saved, then you need to get out there and share the good news, right? We need to do everything we can to encourage people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Invite them to come to church. Pray for them. Talk to them about your decision and what it means to you and give people that opportunity to be saved. That's our biggest assignment as Christians. We have the key, right? We have the authority. We have the commission. And we need to invite people to come to faith in Christ. Let's all stand and pray.